Jane Hart basically is an independent consultant, speaker, and writer. She's in an internationally known specialist in the use of social media for learning and working. Jane is the founder of the Center for Learning and Performance Technologies, a free resource site on the use of technologies for learning and performance, which has become one of the world's most visited websites about learning with over 100,000 visits per month. Uh, Jane set up the Social Learning Center, which offers members a number of different ways to find out how social media can be used to support continuous learning and performance improvement in the workplace as well as to enhance the social aspects of training and I'm going to share some of her links during the presentation as she talks and so on and I've been following her for several years and I've always every time I post about her I basically said that she is both the king and queen for learning tools if you want to know about learning tools you want to know how they're used you want to know who uses them and so on uh, she has the best to me the best site on the planet both the male and female whatever she's the best and I will share some of the links and I'm gonna pass it over to her and I'm gonna disappear and and just be in the chat box and when she needs me I'll I'll appear again so looking for Jane Hart please take over if you have problems uh, moving the slides just tell me and I can move the slides for you okay thank you very much and I'm out of here okay <laughs> thanks for the introduction and um, let me move on and you, you've already um, said a lot about me so I'm not going to say too much more but just let me point out on the map of the UK where I'm based actually it's a bit higher up there near Bath but um, and the sound is terrible I'm hearing so let me see if I can increase it a bit is that better? Okay, good. So, um, in addition to the Center for Learning Performance Technologies that I talked about, I'm also a, a principal of the Internet Time Alliance, and you can see these people here. Uh, you might know some of them, Jay Cross and Clark Quinn and Harold Jarkey and uh, Charles Jen Jennings. And so we work internationally with organizations, helping people on organizations with new approaches to workplace learning. And so today, in my, my presentation, I want to talk quite a lot a bit about workplace learning. But let me just start by asking the question, what do I mean by social learning revolution? And I just recently read a piece in, in an online magazine that said the social web and mobile technologies have accelerated the rate at which relationships develop, information is shared, and influence takes hold. People now use social technology to help shape the world's events and culture. We've seen the power of social media and its effect on society, from the Arab Spring to the global Occupy movement. Citizens of all nations are more empowered than ever before. Connected individuals have rallied crowds, created vast audiences, and toppled political establishments by communicating their message through social networks. And in fact, we're now seeing that seeing the impact of the social revolution on business and even on learning, both in education and the workplace. And social learning isn't, of course, a term used just to describe the way we use social media for learning but it's of course it means everything we do and however how we learn is, is social but the, the revolutionary part of it is that we now do have the tools both social media tools to uh, change the way we're doing things and then this is what's happening now it's impacting both education and the workplace so I wanted to talk today uh, about three things. How individuals are now using social media to use to address their own learning and performance needs. How organizations are responding to this, which has driven new approaches to workplace learning. And in then it, it, some implications for higher education. So let's start with 
how individuals are using social media. Now, many of you may know that for the last five years, I've been compiling a top 100 tools for learning activity based on the contributions of learning professionals worldwide. And this is last year's list. And once again, it's proved to be quite popular, but the important thing to note from it is that the, the list is dominated by free online social media tools, Twitter, YouTube, Google Docs, and so forth. And pure content authoring and delivery systems are slipping down the list. And this is just one of the trends I've been noticing over the last five years. This and the fact that for many people, personal and professional tools are merging. And people are now doing their own thing, using their own devices to do so. And in fact, a uh, big technology analyst, Forrester, has noticed this trend as well in businesses. It estimated last year that around 47% of business users were using one or more websites to do part of their jobs that are not sanctioned by their IT department. And they expected that number to rise to about 60%. And that phenomenon is known as the consumerization of IT. And in a recent CLO magazine, it showed that between one-third and two-thirds of employees were already meeting their learning and performance needs by working around learning and development departments. And some have actually referred to that as a consumerization of learning. Now, if you listen to the press, you'd think it was just Gen Y, millennials who are using social media tools in this way. But it's clearly not the case. It's people of all ages nowadays who are doing this. But the people in the workplace who are doing this, I think, have some common characteristics. They're very web savvy, but they're also highly motivated, committed, and dedicated to their work, and have a clear desire to do their job as well as they possibly can. So I've called these people smart workers. I've also been able to identify eight characteristics of or features of how people are using social media and how it's impacting and changing the way they're working and learning. So I wanted to share this research with you today. First of all, it's clear that the smart worker recognizes she learns continuously as she does her job. Although she acknowledges that training and self-directed study have a valuable part to play in this, she also realizes that formal approaches alone cannot possibly provide her with everything she needs to know. She also recognizes she learns more about how to do her job just by doing her job. But that learning in this way is very different from, say, studying a formal course. It's unstructured. Some even call it messy. So she might find out something new when she reads a document, from overhearing a conversation, by observing her colleagues at work, and so forth. But she does realize she's learning all the time in all sorts of ways, from both content as well as from people. But what is more, the smart worker wants immediate solutions to his performance problems. In other words, he doesn't want to have to study a problem just in case he might need it. He simply wants to find the solution to his problem when he needs to in the quickest and easiest way possible. And it's precisely for this reason, rather than using the internal learning management system to find courses, that the smart worker makes heavy use of Google to search the social web for solutions to his problems, preferring to access quick and simple resources on sites like YouTube and SlideShare and Wikipedia. He therefore makes significant use of resources that have been created and freely shared by others on the social web since they frequently prove to be valuable performance support materials for him. What's more, he's also very happy to share what he knows in the same way using the very same tools. And this recent infographic shows the extent of the sharing of information and resources that's taking place on the web in just one internet minute. And just take a look at 
some of those figures. 30 hours of video uploaded, 1.3 million video views, 100,000 new tweets every minute. Although up to now I've shown you how the smart worker likes to access content to solve problems, in fact, like most people, she actually tries to solve her problems by first calling upon the people she knows to help her. A few years ago, this would simply have meant asking her colleagues in the room for help, but now smart workers have access to a much wider group of friends and colleagues through their online social networks. And in this respect, public social networks like Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, as well as specialist online communities play, play a very important role for her in both her personal and professional lives. And the smart worker interacts with her colleagues here in many different ways. To ask and answer questions, exchange ideas, solve problems, keep up to date what they're doing, what they're thinking about and just in fact to learn from them in many different ways sometimes without even realizing it. It's also clear that the smart worker learns best with and from others both in a formal and informal context. This is of course the true social learning. It happens without social media but social media can make it an even more powerful experience. And in formal training contexts, although the smart worker is happy to be able to work on online courses at the time of her choosing and at her own pace, she doesn't actually enjoy having to sit at her desk plowing through hours of online content. She much prefers to learn alongside others where she could discuss the topic and bounce ideas off them. The smart worker also uses social media to keep up to date both what is happening in his industry as well as his profession by using a variety of social tools and services. He keeps in touch with experts, analysts and his professional network as we've seen. He reads industry blogs, or aggregated feeds and even content curated from a variety of different sources. It's also clear that the smart worker wants to do her job as well as possible, which involves not just a continuous learning process, but constantly reviewing her productivity in order to find better ways to do her job. So she makes significant use of social media tools to help with both personal and team productivity. And these tools are used not only to automate or improve existing tasks, and activities, but sometimes even to innovate and to do things differently. Finally, the smart worker is a self-reliant individual who likes to make his own decisions about the tools he needs to do his work and the most appropriate way to learn. In fact, he thrives on autonomy. And as Dan Pink points out in his book, Drive, the surprising truth about what motivates us, this is key. A sense of autonomy has a powerful effect on individual performance and attitude. And whereas control leads to compliance, autonomy leads to engagement. If you haven't read this book, it really is a must read. So how then are organizations reacting to these ways people are using tools themselves? Well, what I've tried to do is plot the adoption of social tools along Jeffrey Moore's technology adoption curve. This shows what the innovators and early adopters are doing, the left hand end, as well as the math of the early and late adopters, late majority, sorry, in the middle and the laggards at the end. Once a new technology is seen as mainstream, it's said to have crossed the chasm, that's that yellow bit there. So this is my rough and ready guide to what organizations are doing vis-a-vis -vis social technologies. First of all, there are still many organizations who ban or block all access to social media, usually because they don't understand it properly and, and see it as some kind of threat. But Gartner recently reported that the number of large organizations blocking access to all social media is dropping by around 10% a year. 
It was around 50% in 2010 and they think it's likely to drop to fewer than 30% by 2014. So that's why I put it in the laggards area. But as we've already seen, many individuals in these organizations can still access these tools through their own devices, their iPads, their iPhones, whatever. So a growing number of organizations have realized the futility of trying to ban social media and are developing BYOD, bring your own device strategies in the organization. Although this is still emerging practice and some places it really is still only for senior people. But of course some departments and processes such as marketing do require access to external social media and they use public social media sites, Facebook and Twitter and so forth, for promoting their products and services. And in some organizations, they're beginning to use social media for internal activities and this includes the training function. They've begun to incorporate social tools into their workshops and own online courses. But some organizations are now realizing that social media has a much more important part to play more widely in the organization to support employee collaboration and engagement and are now implementing their own internal social collaboration platforms and in doing so are becoming social businesses. So what is a social business? Well, IBM described it quite neatly here. A social business isn't just a company that has a Facebook page and a Twitter account. It's one that embraces and cultivates a spirit of collaboration and community through its organization, both internally and externally. Many commentators believe that becoming a social business is going to change the way organizations do everything because they'll be moving from like, traditional hierarchical businesses to networked organizations. So social won't be just something that's bolted on to traditional processes, but will underpin, underpin sorry, a fundamental new approach to working and learning in the organization. And Paul Adams summed it up quite nicely. And I think this is relevant to both education as well as corporate learning. Social is not a feature. Social is not an application. Social is a deep human motivation that drives our behavior almost every second that we're awake. The leading businesses are recognizing that the web is moving away from being centered around content to being centered around people. That's the biggest social thunderstorm. And all of us are going to have to understand it to succeed. So stop talking about social as a distinct entity assume it in everything you do. So I've looked now at the two ways that social media is beginning to change the workplace. Firstly, how individuals are using these tools to address their own learning and performance needs. And secondly, how organizations are themselves beginning to transition into social businesses. So many organizations want to know how they can support these new ways of working and learning. And the fact that knowledge sharing and collaborative working is going to become a key feature of being a social business. Well, the early adopters are already doing things differently. And they usually require help in some sort of framework. So I want to talk very briefly about some of the new approaches to workplace learning that we're seeing. And these, in fact, will have implications, as I think, for education in terms of how we prepare those in education for the new approaches in learning in the workplace. And I, one of the major frameworks that is in use is something called the 70-20-10 framework. And this was actually developed at Princeton University. But what it does, it recommends that organizations think far less about formal training. In fact, they reckon that only 10% of what they do should be around structured courses and programs. Whereas the other 90% is more about experiential learning and development. I've come up with a 
similar sort of framework, which I've called the Workforce Development Services Framework. And I think there are four key areas here that organisations will need to concentrate on, focus on, in terms of supporting the different types of learning activities that take place in the organisation. Firstly, there's traditional training, as we know it. So this framework then consists of uh, four elements, the training element, the performance support element, because we've seen that people need help in their performance support activities. It's not just about training. But the big piece that's missing from most organizational frameworks is this social collaboration piece, where we need to start helping people build networks and communities and just general collaboration spaces where people can work. And also, uh, we need to start changing the mentality of, organ of people within the organization. So it's not just about training is going to solve problems. There are going to now be many, many n different ways to solve problems. And so we need to think about more of a, what I call a performance consulting approach, where instead of people coming and asking for courses, they ask for support and help with dealing with problems. And that actually within the workforce or in the workplace is quite a different way of a approaching supporting learning. And that social collaboration piece I talked to you about is quite important too because previously we thought about collaboration as just this top bit, people just getting together and making things happen. But now we realize that there's a lot happening under this wavy line, which you might think about as being hidden from view, but which is about helping people get to those top level parts of the um, collaboration pyramid. It's about helping people use their personal networks to access knowledge, information and skills which they don't uh, which they don't have in their team already, but which are really instrumental for their success. So this whole aspect of social collaboration is going to be really key for the future, a really key skill that people are going to need to acquire, how you use those networks, how you find and discover people, how you share what you know, and how you make yourself visible and participate. Because the future of the workplace is going to be much more around collaborative working and learning. So when I talk to people, organizations, about this new approach to workforce development, they say to me, where should they focus their efforts? Because you know, previously, they've only really been concentrating on training, and now I'm telling them they need to sort of broaden their view to many different ways. So I thought, well, rather than answer that question myself, I'd ask some of the people who follow me on my blog how they best learn in the workplace. So what I did was I asked them, so I gave them 10 different ways which I took from my anal analysis of how smart workers are learning in the workplace that I've just showed you. Uh, company training, a uh, self-directed study of internal course, of external courses, sorry. Internal company documents, internal job aids, collaborations within your team, comp general conversations, using personal and professional networks and communities outside the organization external blogs, content curated from external sources, and, and in fact using Google for the web. And I asked people to rate them as not important, somewhat important, right through to essential. And very quickly a pattern established itself, and I'm going to show you now the results after 131 responses. There's been actually a lot more since that time, but uh, this is what it looked like after 131 responses and actually you probably see some very interesting results. If you look up here at company training, actually nearly 50% of people only rated it as somewhat important and another 20% reckoned it not important. So that makes about 70% of people saying it's really not that important for them in the workplace. So what was most important? Well, if you look down here, you, you can see that almost 90% of people thought that uh, collaborative working was much more important for them. 
and again if you look down the bottom you can see that just using Google to search around to find solutions to their problems nearly 50% of people thought that was essential in the workplace so we're getting a very different view of what's important for people in the workplace and if we uh, they created a weighted list which you can actually see better here so at the top we have collaborative working professional networks and so forth right down to company training and then I uh, some key areas and you can now see quite clearly that this whole area of social and collaboration is really the way that people prefer to learn and uh, it's also a lot towards um, people creating their own personal learning as well. So I think this survey also tells us something else of important, that those who are effective social learners are also highly autonomous people who manage their own learning. And it's actually these people who are leading the way in organizations. So we need to think about how we can support more personal learning strategies, as I call it, and how we can support that in order to perhaps drive more collaboration activities. And I think this is part where we can start seeing how it maps into education, because these new strategies that some people will need to acquire, we perhaps need to start helping them acquire these things in education rather than waiting until they get to the workplace. And what I mean by that is helping people become independent workers who are able to acquire knowledge and skills in many different ways, continuously and one-off online or face to face or whatever whatever way it might be but in but by choosing the most appropriate approaches that suit their own job role or preferences and of course this is completely different from the way most workplace organizations uh, organize, uh, are dealing with things so it's very much top down one size fits all approach here am i thing i think it's much more about supporting individual personal learning strategies. So what are the key elements of personal learning strategies? Well, my colleague Harold Jarkey helped me come up with this list of seven things, which, as I say, I think are relevant for education as well as for the workplace. The first one is that we need to now take responsibility and control for our own learning, personal and professional development not expect everything to be provided to us. That means we need to stop spoon feeding people and give them spoons in order to help them uh, be able to look after their own needs for themselves and not expect someone to feed them everything they need to know. Also we need to, number two, help them get organized help them find the tools and resources they need to address their own problems and to help with their learning and development. Now this might be using some enterprise tools but it may also be using um, personal tools that they have found on their own travels around the web. Then we need to help them use a process of personal knowledge management, PKM it's referred to. And we, in order to make sense of it all, we need to help them with this continuous process of what my colleague Harold Jarkey calls seek, sense, and share. Now seeking is when you go and find out things, keep up to date, and actually being part of a network of people will help be helpful in this regard because it allows you to have information pushed to you by your trusted sources. Uh, it's important to develop listening skills in order to observe and study what other people are doing. But having got that information, you then need to make sense of it. And that's about personalizing and contextualizing it 
and includes reflection and putting into practice what's been learnt. But the third part is sharing it and this includes exchanging resources, ideas and experiences within our networks and collaborating with our colleagues. And that sharing part is really key because this whole slide here explains how important it is, how we need to become a valued contributing node in a network. So in other words, it's not just listening in or lurking in a network or community, but participating and contributing. We need to become a valued contributing node. And we learn from other people, of course, but we also need to share our own discoveries. And we do that by narrating our work. Now this is a new approach to keeping track of what we're doing, but it's an integral part of our daily work. It's about narrating our learning, what we're learning, and help to reflect on it ourselves and help others to help us to reflect on it. But it involves regularly recording our activity, our achievements, and our reflections. And that might be in a personal blog. It might be in the activity stream of a community tool. But it's going to be in the workflow for others to read and learn from. And I think that's a new approach to learning because previously it's all been locked up in a learning management system, you know, very difficult to access for other people. But here we are openly and transparently narrating what we are learning so that we can converse with others about it, help them to learn, and also help us to make sense of what we're talking about as well. But in the workplace, of course, unlike education, it's not just about learning for its own sake. It's actually about doing your job, getting your, you know, achieving a task or an activity, performing, in fact. And performance is the key here in the workplace. So actually, success needs to be measured in terms of performance, not in terms of learning. You know, course completions and test results and so forth don't mean much in terms of how you can complete a task. So it's, we need to start thinking about how we measure performance changes and how we can see how learning has become resulted in new, in new, new behaviors or attitudes or whatever it may be. And then finally, uh, it's about reflecting on reviewing on what we're doing. Because things are changing constantly. As Harold points out, life is in perpetual beta. Things don't stand still. So we need to continuously review our learning and working strategies in the light of a changing world. So what I learn to do today may well be out of date tomorrow. And the sources of information I use today might not be of value tomorrow. So, you know, this is just a one-off thing that we do. We constantly need to reflect and review on what we're doing, how we're learning, where we're getting the most value. We need to look for and find new sources. We need to find and follow new people in our networks and even change the people who we might follow already. So in fact, you know, social learning is not just about lots of people getting together. It's about the individual in the networks taking a responsibility for being part of social learning. And Harold says it quite neatly here, PKM, which is personal knowledge management, is our part of the social learning contract. And you know, I remarked in my blogs and things that the individual's role in social learning is as important as the technology. So it's not about just giving people tools or telling them to use blogs or wikis. That's not going to happen. Learning won't necessarily take place. It's about helping individuals recognize that being parts of networks and doing exactly what I've just mentioned, sharing and contributing in those networks, that learning then takes place and social learning happens. So uh, I think that is the biggest lesson from what I'm trying to present to you today, that you know, tech, it's not just about the technology. You can't just throw these tools at people and expect it to happen. So it's something that in the workplace we're having to deal with, having to deal with how we help people learn using the technology uh, to 
to, to learn in better ways. And I think, therefore, this means that, as I mentioned earlier, education has an important part in developing and building those new skills. Because it's not going to be about you know arriving in the workplace and then having to learn them from scratch. It's about building those collaboration skills, helping individuals build their own personal learning strategies, so that when they do get to the workplace, they can become engaged, productive members of the workforce. So I know many of you in education are looking perhaps to see how you can use social approaches in your teaching and, and your classrooms. But I think in addition to that, you need to bear in mind how you can begin to build those new skills as you do so. So for me, I think social media in education has a, can, can, can do this quite considerably. And there are a number of ways that you can think about in education how you can not only support your teaching and learning, but also, as I say, start to build those skills that are going to be important from the workplace. It also means perhaps moving from a top-down, sage on the stage type, type approach to teaching, you know, where ex you're the expert standing at the front delivering content to people, and much more about supporting learning in groups and people working together and learning together with you there as a guide on the side. So just some of the ways that I talk to people about how we can do this, it's, it's very much about helping learners to connect with one another uh, in the best way possible. Now in the old days it used to be email or discussion forums, many of the modern day social platforms use activity streams, which allows learners to converse together, uh, set up profiles, you know, so they can actually meet one another first of all, and then converse together in the flow of work, just like they would do, say, in Facebook. And then this activity can stream can actually then be used as a back channel to your classroom activities. So you've got a constant flow of what people are thinking about in the back channel. And I think that's just as important for uh, learning as the front channel, if you like, which is the sort of delivery mechanism. So connect and converse is an important part of getting people to build those connections. And then the second thing is helping them to share what they know. That might be content in terms of links and resources. And it might just be about um, primary sources, just links to sources, or it might actually be doing some curation of content, bringing together uh, some of the best content they find to share with one another. And nowadays, as you probably know, there are many content curation tools which support that. And it means you can filter out some of the extraneous sources of information that probably end up being rather too much noise around what people want to learn. I know Zaid has written a lot about content curation, so I probably won't say too much about that. But additionally, it's also about helping people contribute to the course. So again, not just thinking about the course has to be cura uh, created and driven top down by you as a teacher or lecturer, but um, actually encouraging contributions by course members. Now that by, might be doing something simple like you know blogging, you know, might be group blogs. It might be getting them to create and, and share presentations or even videos, which seem to be very popular in uh, some courses in universities. Or screencasts, you know, little demos of what's happening on the screen. But the whole, whatever way you do it, it's, not, it's immaterial in many cases, but it's about just getting people feel comfortable to contribute to that learning community that you're now building in the classroom. And then the fourth element is about collaboration. And this, of course, is then getting to actually work to, together towards achieving a goal. And uh, 
that might be simply like just using some sort of notebook, notice board, online notice board to sort of um, plot their communications with one another. But it also might be more substantial collaborative writing activities where you might use something like Google Docs. Or it might be creating uh, more knowledge bases or knowledge resources using a wiki type approach to things. But it's about moving from that contribution area to actually working together to collaborate with one another. And as I said, these kinds of activities can easily be introduced into any course, but it does mean changing your mindset in terms of what a course is all about. With using social media, it's no longer about pushing the message down, but about um, getting people to become part of the whole process of learning. And I think if we can start doing that in education, then this means we're then producing or developing skills of learners that are really going to become very relevant for the future. Uh, I've started to do some very similar sort of work in my own social learning centre, which Saeed mentioned up front. I run some very simple little workshops, which <coughs> cover some of these areas. And I try to take a very informal approach to it, using some of the processes that I've mentioned to you today. So um, if you're interested in that, you can come and look, see what we're doing at the social learning centre. But I see in the uh, chat, you're asking me if these uh, slides will become available. And yes, of course they will. And on the back of the slides, you'll see all my contact details and then links to some of the resources that I've written from which I've taken some of the words I've used today. So if you want to delve into some of this stuff into a bit more detail, you can do that. So uh, well, now ten to hour, so I'm going to finish now, Zaid. If you have any questions you want to feed through to me. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I before they ask you questions, I want to ask you a question. <laughs> Is okay. that okay? <laughs> yes. Okay. I was just I was just wondering your, your website. Are you managing it by yourself or you actually have a team? Because I'm amazed how much <laughs> things that appear on that website for the last four years. Are you doing it by yourself or you actually have a small team to ma manage the websites? No. Or your websites? Or I do it all myself. My God. <laughs> Can I ask you how many hours? A part, of my <laughs> As part of my process of learning uh, because just like I've explained, you know, I find things. Yeah. I make sense of them and then I share what I do. So it's a constant process for me of just sharing what I find out. So uh, it's just a gradual okay, process. I have a second Maybe question. I'll do something. Yeah. Okay. okay. The second one is uh, you, you're using WordPress now, right? Uh, I noticed that the yeah. WordPress has more interactive features, but the design you had when you were using maybe Dreamweaver was more. Uh, it seems that you had more freedom to manipulate the design because now you seem to be restricted terms, especially I noticed some of the lists and so on. Can you maybe comment a bit on that, your struggles with using WordPress to, to, to visualize the way you visualized previously, but now you've got more interactive features? That's a good point, yes. I mean, with, with the previous version, I actually didn't use Dreamweaver. I used Front Page, uh, which was a very okay, okay, okay. authoring tool. And I really liked that, actually. Not pe many people did, but I did. But it did give me a lot of freedom. But what it didn't give me the freedom to very easily uh, was to create new style sheets and make complete changes to the look and feel, you know, just in one go. Huh. And of course, that's what WordPress gives you because it very easily sets up the look and feel from the content and so I can apply new themes you know on a regular basis to give my whole site you know a different look if I want but then that does constrain you a little bit in terms of you know how you can set things up but I find the flexibility of design probably more important for me now than uh, you know, having the flexibility of perhaps the 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 layout if you like in terms of my ability to change bits and pieces on my own and of course it does mean that I can use things like BuddyPress which is a plug-in to WordPress yeah, cool. so it means you can evolve your site into something much bigger than just a blogging site. 
Yeah. Okay, I, I, I'll, I'll let us just ask the crowd maybe. Anyone wants to ask any questions? I'm sure they have some questions to ask. I mean, it's easy to ask through, ask through the chat then actually. If you want the mic also, we can give you the mic. If somebody wants the mic, just say, hi, I want the mic. You, know, you can actually talk. So I do put your question in the chat box. So you say, I want the mic. I'll give you the mic and then you can have a, uh, you share your question or maybe maybe some of your reflections or maybe some of your experiences, okay? So please, uh, anyway, either through the mic or through the chat, you have to start from the chat. Do you want to ask any questions? I'm sure you do, so please do. Just wait for some people to type a few things if they're going to type in. I don't know if there was any yeah, while waiting. things coming past me. <laughs> Okay, but interesting. While during this uh, uh, webinar, we had actually 15 from the Ministry of Education. I don't know, not Ministry of Education. They have some group that the, the, the top people in the education. They, they have I don't know the ACEP. Uh, they actually got together and they actually joined the session during their workshop. So that was quite interesting. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but we're, we're very happy to have you here. Thank you very much for being here, and uh, I'm sure everyone that attended benefit very much. Okay, but we're still waiting for the questions. I can see a few people are typing things in, so has none <coughs> and no. So hopefully it'll pop up soon. I'm just looking back through the chat to see if there's anything in there. Did you notice anything that came in whilst I was talking? Other than uh, problems with my voice. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, no. Okay, there we got a question there. Have we? How do you psycho people into wanting to... Not psych, not psycho, uh, psych. Well, you can't make people share. You can't make people be social. So that's the first lesson. You can't make this happen. You can't force people to do it. All you can do is build on what's already happening. There are people who are sharing quite happily and uh, they can show what they're doing with others, encourage people. So I think it really is a very different matter of helping people do it. And we're moving away from this command and control approach to doing things. You must collaborate. You must be social. You must do this too. Let's let's have a look and see what it's like and share it, share and see what it, get a feel with it. And I, I, when I'm talking to people, I, sh I show them what I do and I'll say to them that it might not suit you to do exactly like this, but at least you can see the benefits it's bringing me and maybe it might inspire you to think about doing something similar, you know, if it's only a tiny thing. So for instance, I might start with something like Twitter and I say, well, I use Twitter to share lots of links and things. So that's a sharing mentality and it's no big deal, but it might take you a bit of time to sort of feel comfortable with doing that. So it hasn't got to happen overnight, but just gradually to take people, help, help people through the process of becoming confident and competent to do it. Okay. Well, plagiarism, now this is, I think if you're in education, then I think the whole concept of plagiarism is going to have to change, isn't it? I think if you, you are sharing things and copying things, you need to be very clear about where your sources lie and cite appropriately, certainly in education at this moment in time, so that you don't get uh, into trouble with the authorities. But I think the whole concept of sharing and plagiarism will probably change but that will probably take a little time. What's the future of mobile collaborative informal? And I think, well that's a very good question. There's lots and lots of stuff happening with mobile. Mobile is really the way ahead. I don't know about Malaysia, how, how significant mobile use is. I know in some countries, you know, mobile actually use exceeds PC use, so it's really going to be the way forward. And of course, a mobile device is a social device, isn't it? You know, you talk to people on it, you chat to people on it, you text people. So this is going to be really the ideal device for collaborating and and becoming more social with people in different ways. So I think um, 
the mobile devices actually lend themselves in some ways much more to this kind of approach. What are the tools which help in improving your productivity? Is that my personal productivity? Okay, well I'll, I'll talk about my personal productivity. Well, I, I have to say that for me, one of the most key Twitter for me. Now that might seem strange, but I use that tool as a, as a tool that helps me with every day with finding out what's going on in the world of workplace learning. And uh, pretty much the first thing I do is to look at Twitter and see what's come in overnight. I have use a device that allows me to store the links that have been tweeted by my people I follow. So I, const I can review those and I can do that in, my, in Google Reader. So Google Reader is another key tool for me. Um, Skype is another key tool where I can have it open all the time and I communicate with my colleagues and contacts just you know as and when. It's not something I have to sort of turn on and fire up. It's always on on my desktop. The other thing is about um, having access to my other communities and I'm, I'm a responsible for a number of communities so I have those open or as a tab on my browser all day long and I can see activity there. So I think the important thing about tools is that they've got to become part of your workflow. If a tool is something you do as an extra or a community is a place you go as an extra thing, it's not seen as part of your workflow. It won't become a productivity tool. So I think it's about choosing things that are just going to improve what you already do or actually help you do things differently and certainly tools like Twitter and Google Reader which is an RSS reader allow me to keep up to date with what's happening much much better ways than I could ever have done say 10 years ago. So I think um, there are lots of tools out there and if you look on my top 100 tools list you'll see lots of tools that people use as I say not just for, for learning per se but for continuous imp performance improvement. So uh, what else have we got here in, in terms of questions? Can't see anything. Tech savvy worship and a traditional boss. Oh yes, indeed there is. And this is this is probably where the, the biggest um, issues arise because a tech savvy worker is an autonomous worker who wants to do his or her own thing and has the tools to do his or her own thing, whereas a traditional boss wants to um, you know, keep to the old traditional ways. Now how do you close the gap? Well, you need to start talking to the traditional boss because the tech savvy worker is not going to change his or her ways. He's now got the tools to do what he wants himself. Whether the traditional boss likes it or not, it's going to happen. Uh, one of my colleagues said, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Or you can't, you know, you can't um, change what's already happened. People are already going, always going to be doing this stuff. So all you can do is help the traditional boss. And that probably means help him get over them, you know, change the way he thinks about work. And of course that may well come from the culture of the organization. So it might not just be the boss, it might be the whole organization that needs to think differently about work. And okay. I think what we're seeing now when people are coming to, organ to, um, to join up to organizations, they're trying to find organizations that match their way of doing things. So, you know, if the organizations don't change, they're not going to attract new talent who want to have more autonomy in what they do and how they do it. So I think organizations got to change. But meanwhile, bosses, well, you can only show them that it's not a big threat to them. It's just the just way of doing things differently. And I think the threat aspect is the thing that really concerns them the most. So it's about reassuring them that it's not to going to put them out of business. Their, their role may change as well and it's going to be much more about supporting what people are doing rather than um, trying to stop it happening. I was just wondering, uh, I mean, I've seen WikiLeaks and so on, but uh, what about the secret service? Uh, service? Uh, I mean, you're running for secret service now with all these medias to share the secrets. How do they manage? I, I just can't imagine it must be a nightmare if you're you're working for CIA or FBI or any secret service and, and, and you have to manage all these secrets with all these tools that can share on the spot. You know, so 
it's it must be really challenging for that kind of organizations that ha I mean for yeah it must be challenging to keep uh, certain secrets out of the public uh, we see that with WikiLeaks and all this but I mean yeah. it must be quite challenging I mean some organizations do have to sh uh, keep certain things secret uh, so that might be also mm -hmm. another way of looking at the uh, challenge yeah yeah, well, I think obviously all, every organization has its own intellectual property that it wants to defend, and that's fine. And I think this is where we're seeing a lot of internal social platforms being quite popular because it allows people to have those con conversations internally, you know, with people who uh, are able to view this stuff. But, you know, externally, obviously, you're not going to tweet, you know, go on Twitter and talk about all your, all your secret confidential files. So, but. Uh, <laughs> It is, you know, you start using the right tool for the right purposes, I think. But, the, the, funnily enough, the uh, as far as I know, and I don't know this in great detail, but I believe the CIA does use social technologies in quite, <laughs> quite a good way. I think we need to look that one up and see what they do, but I've got a feeling that they, they do make use of it. And it's a bit like the um, U.S. Army as well, as I understand. They say, well, we give our we give our people rifles so we don't shoot one another, so we might as well give them social tools because, you know, then we trust them to, <laughs> to use them appropriately. So I think trust is a big thing here, and certainly the organizations that are, are moving towards more sharing, collaborative approaches are perhaps trusting, if you like, more trusting organizations, whereas others always see the, the problems and the issues that might happen and put in place so many safeguards that it makes life and working very, very difficult. They are sort of throwing out the baby with the bathwater, you know, and so this is what's happening when most organizations are banning social media. They see it as a big threat, scared by it, so shut it down and don't realize that by shutting it down, they're actually not, you know, causing themselves more problems in the long run, I think. Okay, can I, can I go back to the first question? I'm, I'm still, because since I like to share stuff, I just wonder how, on the average, how many hours a day do you actually spend, spend sharing stuff? I know you spend a lot of time learning, but because uh, well, look at your site, you have your blog, I think you have two blogs, you, you have your slide share presentations, and then you do your workshops, and then you do so webinars, and, and then you have your courses and so on. How, how much time do you get to actually spend down there and start sharing? Or you do multitasking while you're teaching, you're also sharing, or I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably multitasking is very true. I've, be, I've become more of a multitasker, I think. I used to be fairly focused on you know one task, but I do quite a lot of simultaneous tasks now. But yeah, know, how many I'm tweets did you do while during, during the webinar? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do any. I didn't do any on it. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, I do, do, uh, tweet Twitter is open on my desk all day, and notifications come in top right hand corner of my desk top. So I'm seeing new things come in, and if okay. I spot something, I will deal with it, and you know I will okay. retweet it. Okay, I just want to ask you one more question. I mean, Pinterest. I was just reading a lot of now. Suddenly, everyone's talking about Pinterest, or how you pronounce it, Pinterest, or oh, yeah. uh, that social uh, curation tool. Uh, what is your opinion on, on that tool itself for teaching and learning? I mean, it's it's very visual and so on, but I'm, I, I found it to be a bit slow and uh, uh, the tag. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if you love the tag or whatever. But what do you you personally think of it? I mean, besides the exclusiveness of looking like Flickr, but it's a it's a resource sharing site and so on. What is your opinion um, on Pinterest until now? Um, I, well, I I have a I have a Pinterest account but I don't actually use it, I have to say. I, you know, I went on there just probably like you did, just to see what it was all about. But at the moment in time, it hasn't do anything for me that I need, so I haven't really made much use of it. But I do know of some educators that are using it, and that's the whole visual aspect. I suppose you can see, think of it as visual bookmarking that they like. And you know, in an educational context, they find their students like it. So I think, you know, if it works for some people, that's good. But you, for me, like you, it probably doesn't do very, very much. <laughs> yeah, I'm still old-fashioned on the delicious. Happen, you, it's a, a I'm I'm to, I'm <laughs> to understand Twitter. Maybe it'll take me time. Yeah, it took me six months for Twitter. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. You, I'm sure you're busy today. <laughs> What's your program? I mean, maybe you have another session or something, uh, meeting soon. So I don't know how much time you have left. Uh, a lot of people. Cause now it's actually 5, 10 here. People are going back from office now. 
So that's why you can see people actually leaving the classroom because yeah. they're trying to escape yeah, the jams, especially those <laughs> staying yeah. in KL is like full of jams. <laughs> But I would like to say thank you, thank you very much for being here with us and we really appreciate it and uh, we hope that you share your slides on SlideShare because I don't want to share it for you and I'm, I'm not sure whether I have the copyright to do that either but it would be good if you, if you could share it on SlideShare then I'll just add the link to the post that we have okay. regarding your webinar and uh, definitely okay. you have definitely got some more serious new facts here <laughs> and we, we really appreciate it and, and I'm sure people okay, will be contacting great. you either through email and so on and thank you thank you thank you very much and I hope we didn't take up too much of your time and and so on and you had fun although we had a bit stressed yeah. uh, getting you getting your audio <laughs> yes it was good thank you so much yeah. uh, okay thank, thank you, you much so much for uh, anytime you want yes thank you uh, uh, so but anytime you want to uh, 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 leave the room it's not considered, uh, I mean, that's understandable, and because I, I, I will close it in about two minutes yeah. to clo uh, close the room, the webinar room. Um, but just say thank you, thank you very much again, and we really, really appreciate it for being here. And it's, uh, it's another uh, sign, or not a sign, it's, it's another way of showing how much you share, <laughs> and the power of sharing that exactly. people, because we had actually guests from quite a few countries. <laughs> we, we had actually quite a few guests from different countries also Excellent. besides Malaysia, uh, so, that, so that was great. Okay. So All thank right, you, thank okay. you very much. Uh, there's no more questions. Okay. And I'm also going to rush off. <laughs> thank okay. you, thank you, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Everyone, okay. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. <laughs>